Good morning. Uh, let us start this time with a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we lift your name on high and we want to just praise you this morning and just to hear your truth and just to worship you uh, together as a church family. God, I uh, pray that your truth will be presented here and that we will be open to receive it and just being able to grow closer to you because of it, God. Uh, I pray that you just help us to remember you and to glorify you in all that we do in your name. Amen. Well, the holiday season is coming, and I see all the nice, beautiful red out there. I got mine because, of, you know, Liberty, they did well yesterday. And so I uh, just want to give you guys a couple announcements for you. The first is, uh, if you are a guest here, first, second, third time, uh, we have welcome cards just right in the pew in front of you. You just grab that, uh, fill it out real quick, and then when the offering plate comes by, you just drop it right in and try to make that as uh, simple as we can for you. Uh, Christmas Eve is in two days. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Christmas Eve is in two days, uh, and we do our Christmas Eve candlelight service here uh, at 7 o'clock, so please make plans for that. I know it's going to be a very special night, uh, and it's going to be a very good time. Uh, outside the nursery in that hallway is the offering envelopes for the 2020 year, so be looking for yours in that, and if you don't, there's instructions uh, over there for that as well. Again, just be looking in your goals, and there's always more information than what I have time to give you up here, uh, so be looking in there. But we're going to start with a time of greeting, uh, so please stand and greet one another this morning. All right, everyone, we're going to sing out of our hymnal today, singing more Christmas carols, of course, starting with page 87, 87, song 87, Joy to the World, will you turn to 87, Joy to the World. Here we go. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her King. Nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, for thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known, far as the curses as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations Angels we have heard on high, Song 100.
four. See him in the manger laid, whom the choirs of angels praise. Mary, Joseph, in your aid, while our hearts in love we raise. Page to the left, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, they rolled familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the broken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no on earth I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good will to men. Then peal the bells for loud and clear, is not dead nor done he sleep, the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, good will to men. And we'll finish with 91, Silent Night. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly Silent night, holy night, darkness flies, all is light. Shepherds hear the angels sing, alleluia, hail the King. Christ the Savior is born, Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, the Radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of 
But it wasn't his child. It wasn't his child. Yet still he took him as his own. And as he watched him grow, it brought him joy. He loved that boy. Though it wasn't his child, it wasn't his child. But like a father, he was strong and kind and good. And I believe he did his best. It wasn't easy for him, but he did all he could. His son was different from the rest. It wasn't his child. It wasn't his child. And when that boy became a man, took his father's hand and soon the world would all know why it wasn't his child it wasn't his child and like his father he was strong and kind and good and I believe he did his best. It wasn't easy for him, but he did all he could. He grew up with his hands in wood. And he died with his hands in wood. For he was God's child, he was God's child, he was her man, she was his wife, and late one winter night he knelt by her while she gave birth, it wasn't his child. 
it was God's child. I love that song. I love that song. Let's go to a time of uh, prayer and meditation. Let me lead you. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time of, of celebration as we look towards the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for an anointing, a blessing upon this time. And with so many other things speaking out to us, calling for our time and our attention, I pray that we will remember, for those of us that know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that this is the, the celebration of the hope of our eternity. We thank you for that. Father, we continue to lift up to you people in our church that are struggling with cancer, with, with health issues. Father, we lift them up to you and we, we pray for their recuperation, their strength, their recovery. Father, we pray that they will sense even right now that God's people are praying for them. And Father, as we continue in this time of worship, help us to remember, call us to the fact that it's all about you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right. This is my favorite part of the service. It's children's sermon. Now, if you're a child or a preschooler, come on up. If you if you want an older brother or sister or a parent to come up with you, they are welcome to come up. But come on down. Come on down. We all love seeing you here. All right. Good morning, guys. Wow. You, you know what these are? These are binoculars. I'm not going to put them around my neck. Somebody let me borrow these binoculars. And you know what binoculars are for? They're for looking for things. Let me see. Well, I, I thought I, I thought it was a lot closer, but but as I look through these binoculars, it's it's much much further off than I thought it would be. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm looking at the, through these things backwards. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Let me let me look at through these through, through these correctly. Whoa! It's real close. You know what's close? Christmas is close. Oh my goodness! I thought it would never get here. But it's only three days away. That's a lot closer, particularly when you get older. That's a whole lot closer than you think it is. Well, yes, sir. It is three days away. Not every year, but this year it's on a Wednesday. You know, my grandfather used to tell me when I, when I would visit him, and, and he had a farm, and we had to get up way before everybody and you know, the chi even before the chickens got up, we'd get, we'd get up and I'd be crawling out of my bed. And you know what he would say to me? He said, boy, you're slower than Christmas. I didn't understand what that meant that then, but I understand now. Well, hey, there is something that we do in our church, and, and a lot of times we didn't make as big of a deal about it this year as we did last year or previous years, but we have something that's called the Advent Candles. You want, why don't you guys come around here? I'm going to explain something to you. Come on up, guys. These are the Advent candles that we have, and, and, and they're, they're kind of a tool to help us remember what the season is about. Now, Advent is kind of a fancy word for anticipating something that's going to happen, okay? And so as we look at these Advent candles, they represent things. This first one is a purple candle, and it represents prophecy. See, the birth of Jesus Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament. And so what the Bible prophesies, we believe is going to happen. And the second candle, I believe it's the pink one, isn't it? No, it's another purple one. It is, is the faith candle. And it helps us to remind us that, that Mary and Joseph went forward to Bethlehem in faith. The pink candle is the hope candle, the joy candle. Okay, I meant to have this written down. Is the joy candle, and it reminds us of the joy that the shepherds had when they received news that a new Messiah was born, Jesus Christ. And this one is for today. 
And it is a reminder to us that Jesus Christ is going to be born and that it's pretty close. Now, come to come Tuesday night and we're going to light this candle, which is the Christ candle that celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate in Christmas. Let's have a prayer, okay? Dear God, thank you for Jesus Christ. We have a lot going on during Christmas, and a lot of times with family and presents, but help us to remember the greatest present of all, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Everybody together, amen. Thank you. You are wonderful. Have a seat, guys. Now, how many people learned something from that? I learned to bring my notes. That's what I learned from that. Well, turn in the Word of God to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. We're just going to look at one verse, 18. It's, it's been kind of an, uh, an unusual series because uh, you probably usually don't hear Christmas sermons preached out of Ephesians, but the Lord spoke to me uh, in my quiet time several about a month ago and, and said, preach on this as we look at, at the... Um, well, the Christmas situations, answers to the Christian's Christmas situations that we find ourselves in. I'll be all right. And as you're looking up Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 18, I've got a story to tell you. There was a, a young boy, and his grandparents took him to the mall to see Santa. And as he was sitting on the mall Santa's lap, the, the mall Santa said to him, he said, well, young man, Tell me what you would like for Christmas. And the bo little boy yelled at the top of his lungs, I want a new bicycle. I want a new PlayStation 4. I want a 50-inch television. I want... And Santa stopped him right there. He goes, son, listen, I'm not hard of hearing. And the little boy whispered in Santa's ears, I know, but Grandma is. <laughs> well, it's important. It's important to know where to go to the source for what you're looking for. Now, if you're looking for Christmas gifts, maybe Grandma is the best source for that. But if you're looking for the gift of Christmas, the thing that only God can provide for us, well, the only person to go to is God himself. Well, as I mentioned, we're, we're going through, through a series, and this will be the last one, as we, as we look at answers to the Christmas situations that we find ourselves in. And here's verse 18. It's going to seem like an unusual verse for, for Christmas, but, but I'll get to it. Here's the verse. And don't get drunk with wine which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit. Pastor, I cannot believe you are speaking to a Baptist congregation three days before Christmas about don't get drunk with wine and don't get reckless. Well, everybody knows that Baptists don't drink anyway, don't touch the stuff. Yeah, you're laughing. And there was a time when it was more true than not, and things have, things have changed throughout, well, recent history, and, and I've been in enough homes to know that, that, that not everybody is a total abstainer of, of wine, but, but here's a few things that I want you to think about, particularly as we're in this Christmas situation, because a lot of you will be going to Christmas parties, office parties, different social events, and many of you already have, and, and, and alcohol will be served, wine, beer, whatever. And while you have some freedom in Christ, if I'm totally honest with scriptures, there's the freedom that you have, and then there's the better choice that you have. Here's two things I want you to consider when you're, when you're thinking about this. First of all, think about the example that you're setting before your children. Uh, I can tell you I was a youth minister for a number of years. I can tell you I was a teenager. I can tell you I raised teenagers. And to, to say to them, don't do as I do, do as I say, 
doesn't go very far with them. It didn't go very far with you. It doesn't go very far with them today. You need to think. You need to, to, to consider what is not you had the freedom to do, but what is the best thing for your children and your grandchildren. The second thing is, is you need to, to do the best thing by your Christian witness. When, when you're particularly in public drinking alcohol or wine and, you, and you're not being drunk, you're, you're, you're keeping within your limits, but you are, are, are making that public, people, people do know, people do know, most of them, that, that you are a Christian, that you worship here at Memorial Baptist Church. You need to ask yourself, what type of witness am I setting before other people that either don't have a faith or in Christ or they're weaker in, in their faith in Christ. You need to make not the choice that you had the most freedom in, but you need to make the choice that gives you the best example as somebody that represents Jesus Christ. Those are, are things to think about. Now, now, further in the verse, it says, and reckless drunk and reckless. I any Christian tradition believes that getting drunk is, what's well, a sin. Because why? Well, it says in the verse, it, it leads us to recklessness. It leads you to do things that you would not have done otherwise. It leads you to say things that you would not have said otherwise. And, and when you're doing that, you are losing control of yourself. Folks, the, the Christian discipline life is about control. And I'll get a little bit get to a little bit later about what is supposed to be controlling your life but it's certainly not supposed to be well wine and alcohol you need to be careful about that it does not lead you to recklessness so what is the alternative to that well it tells us right here in the verse be filled by the spirit now when we're talking about being filled by the Spirit, we're not talking about something that you don't already have as a Christian. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in your life. What it's talking about is that if you're being filled by the Spirit, it means that you are being filled by Christ. It means that you are under the control, under the influence of God's Holy Spirit. Now, this is important because the Holy Spirit, just giving you a little bit of theology and understanding about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is something that we receive when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It comes into our life. Our salvation is guaranteed, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is in our life. We do not believe that you can lose it. We do believe that, that you can drift from its influence, but it is there always ready to receive you. It, the Holy Spirit is God's deposit in our life of a greater promise throughout eternity. It gives us wisdom. It gives us discernment. It helps clarify Scripture. It helps us to lead us to understand God's will. And folks, those are just the basics. I haven't even gotten to the particulars yet. But that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It means to be led by the Spirit of God. And when we do that, it has an effect. It has an effect on us, particularly as we're looking towards these days, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. To be filled with the Spirit gives us special blessing. First of all, to be filled by the Spirit means that we receive spiritual joy. Have you ever thought about the difference between happiness and joy? I can tell you, as I was working through this script, this passage here, I, I really struggled with that question. It, it's not an easy question, at least it wasn't for me. The difference between happiness and, and, and joy. And, and what I've come to the conclusion of is, is happiness is more about our circumstances. Yes, I've told you many times happiness is a choice, but sometimes it's a really, really hard choice. And, and also, happiness can tend to be more contemporary to the situation that we are in. So it's situational. Joy is more about the purpose that God has placed on your life. You can be in a spirit of 
joy in being in a, in a situation that is absolutely painful. You can know the joy of God and, and frankly, be really struggling in a situation. In fact, quite often, that is when we understand the joy of God to a great degree is when we're really struggling through our situation. But to be spirit-filled gives us that spiritual purpose, that spiritual fulfillment, that direction in our life. That when we become centered on that, we receive the spirit, the centeredness of God's spiritual joy for our lives. It's an answer to the Christmas situations that we find ourselves in. The next is it gives us spiritual purpose. Now, whether you're a believer or not a believer, we have a, a need to have a need for purpose. Even non-believers have purpose. Their purpose may be their career, their, their purpose may be their hobbies. It may be their politics. It may be their patriotism. And, and these can all be good things. But folks, even, even the best of these things are temporary and, and passing. And quite often we see them pass several times well within our lifestyle, lifetime. But our spiritual purpose is both present and and eternal. It is far greater than any of these other things that I have mentioned. See, we're hardwired to be tapped in to the spiritual purposes that God has for us. See, your original spiritual purpose is that you know God and, and know Him intimately. It's It was hardwired into you before you were created in the flesh. It will be hardwired into you when you go on to the next life. It will be hard, hardwired into you when you enter the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God. It gives us, well, we talked about joy. It gives us a reason for joy. It gives us a reason for an, a greater optimism for not only the present, because we believe that God's in control, but also a greater eternity. This Christmas is a reminder that this is not all that there is. That when we look at the Advent candle, we remember the birth of Jesus Christ. We remember that God has a greater eternal purpose for us in mind. It's an eternal relationship, and it's an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And then the third one, is that you become a spiritual blessing. God wants you engaged in what he is choosing to do here in, a, in your life and around you and throughout, frankly, the ripple effects of what you do really do affect eternity. I, I, I speak to you often. I give, I give illustrations of my grandfather who, frankly, passed 21 years ago, and I can tell you some of the investments that he placed in my life are here in the pulpit with you this morning, and people that invested his, in his life years and generations before, people that I will never know anything about until I see them in the eternal kingdom. But, but they had a sense of, of a spiritual purpose, and that spiritual purpose ended up being a spiritual blessing. Here's something that you find joy in when we talk about the difference between happiness and joy. If you seek happiness for yourself, the best that you will do is having opportunities and moments of happiness. But when you seek to be a spiritual blessing, not only do you find happiness on a diff different level and you find joy on a different level, but God reaches down into, into your life and gives you something that carries over into every situation. He, here's one of the great mysteries of Christianity is, is that if you want to have a joy-filled life, you can't look for a joy-filled life. You've got to invest it in others. You've got to surrender yourself to God's will. That's what it means, once again, to be spirit-filled, surrender your life to God's will and the purpose of 
and the blessings of what God wants to do into your life come into fruition. And you will know joy. And you will know purpose. And you will be a blessing in things that, frankly, you didn't even know existed before. That's how rich God's purposes and blessings are in our lives when we allow ourselves to be obedient and spirit-filled, to be walking like Christ. And so, in this Christmas time, yes, remember the nativity. Remember the, the purpose for why Jesus Christ came. But in the Christmas situations that we find ourselves in, also remember the fruition of what God is choosing to do in and through your life. Joy, purpose, to become a blessing. Isn't God good? Amen. Let me pray for you. Dear God, we thank you so much for being our Lord and our God. Thank you for, thank you for Jesus Christ. Without him, we, we can be religious, we can work hard, but we can never receive the grace through faith. That special gift that God chooses to offer to us if we will but receive Him. And for those of us that have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, oh, that's just when the blessing and the journey begins. Thank you, Father. During this time of the year and throughout the year, really, Help us to realize all that you have for us as we seek to be filled by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This morning, how is God speaking to you? Is he calling you into relationship with him? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? See, this is what we believe. We believe that God created you for a relationship, an eternal relationship with him. But because of sin, that relationship is fractured. You cannot do enough religion or good deeds to, to, to fix that situation. Only God can do that. And how he did that is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come to be born, to be our Savior, who sacrificed his life on the cross and resurrected three days later to show that he had power over death. It is by grace through faith that you ask him into your life, he will come in there and he will dwell forever. You have the assurance of your salvation for all eternity. Have, have you done that? Why wouldn't you do that? Pray to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. Perhaps God has called you to be a, a member of this church, or perhaps you've, you're, you're, you've accepted Christ, but you've not been baptized. You're invited to come forward. Perhaps he has called you to ignore the pastor and come to the altar. He has placed a special calling upon your life. You are invited to respond to God's calling in your life. Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 103. Hymn number 103, Away in a Manger, Please Stand. God bless you for coming to worship today at Memorial Baptist Church. Now, come back Tuesday night.
7 o'clock is candlelight, but I tell you what, you may, we've got a lot of new people in our congregation. You may want to come 30 minutes to 45 minutes, maybe even an hour to make sure you get a good seat. It's going to be a full house. You're going to be blessed. Not everybody feels comfortable making a decision during an invitation time. If God's placed something on your heart or you would like to visit with me about it, I am available to you in the foyer. Eric, would you lead us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for this opportunity that we have just to worship your name and to hear your truth. Uh, I pray that your truth just impacts us in such a way that we can just start growing closer to you more and just being able to worship you in all that we do, God. I pray that we can just leave here, remember what you've done for us, and just be able to uh, push closer to you. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen.